All right. Hey, everyone. This is Rita of the Genesis Home Podcast. And Jason's back. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for having me. Okay, again. So, again. <laughs> the thing is, that besides the fact that you were also my sponsor when I joined DXP, you were on my first episode of the podcast. So, right. once again, thank you for being the the guinea pig to that. You are awesome. <laughs> I've enjoyed the ride. I've like from meeting you to the point where you were, you know, starting Genesis Home Project, you know, the podcast, as well as just everything it, it meant to you as you were kind of transitioning through that life. Um, and, and how you want to give back to the community. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome to witness that journey. So I appreciate you allowing me to, to be a witness to it. Well, thank you for, you know, the support, the advice, the tips. Like there's so many things that went into this that I am incredibly blessed and lucky that the sponsor that I do have is a really good role model. You know, most most people, when they join brokerages, they have that sponsor or that down line guy they kind of just like set you up and then they leave <laughs> you were really a team player in this so thank you <laughs> I, I appreciate the kindness now the thing is we discussed we touched on this in the first episode about how you decided to become a real estate agent in your journey and everything but and you and know, i've been talking about this on and off for a while we really get this question a lot of what can we do with our license or what is the, how can you build a business that's not the, as we know, the, the traditional, which is like, you know, rental, buying, selling, what's the, like, there's other things you can do. There's so many specialties and interest. So how do you, how do you explain that? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's a great question because there are so many different, you know, potential ways to make money, and they're not always that clear. Um, so I'll give examples, right? You can do CMAs. You, your business could be writing comps for people. Um, you can delve into like commercial world and do real estate there, which is totally different than residential. You can do state to state, like EXP has a great model where you're not tethered to a specific city. So you can become a business owner that happens to have a team that does real estate. And by the way, that real estate doesn't have to be geogra geographically bound. Right. It could be New York City. You could have another team in Miami, et cetera. Some of the older brokerages didn't really allow for you to be that spread thin geographically. You would either be like neighboring territories, et cetera. Um, other things that you could do with your real estate license, um, you know, th there's a whole corporate aspect to it. Right. You know, writing CMAs for them as well. Doing short sales. You could become a short sale master or guru, if you will, um, able to, to control that position. Um, Short sales are a very specific niche, right? So you can do other niches within, you know, residential real estate. Um, other things that we're doing with our licenses. So we've started like a property management company. You can jump off into ancillary businesses like title um, work. And it's, it's based upon your experience throughout the real estate transaction, seeing what was a great experience, what wasn't. Um, you know, besides title, you could also do insurance. Some people are... are using that opportunity to uh, start schools, right? There, there's so many different aspects of it. You know, be it corporate, you, you can do residential on your own, you can start your own business. There's so many different avenues that it's very flexible that you don't necessarily have to do that nine to five gr grind of just trying to sell houses one person at a time. And the weird thing is, is how come that's not discussed before we get our license? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I never really understood that. I had to do my own research, and I'm sure you did as well. And a lot of people say, do your research. But every time you do your research, it pops up. The, mm -hmm. you know, you can be a rental agent. You can be a buyer agent. You can be a selling agent. You can be a showing agent. But it doesn't give much depth to what the weight of that license is or the weight of that certificate. And yeah. you just, I just don't understand why that part is so hidden. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's a disconnect between the textbook real estate school, like the education you get from a, from a textbook or trying to pass the exam versus the real world. Um, you know, I, I would love even just real world advice like, hey, this is the optimal way to schedule a show in, as a residential agent or this is how you open a lockbox or this is, you know, things to consider for an open house. There, so there is a gap. And I know I think the challenge is that there's a lot of material to potentially cover 
while you're in school for a couple of weeks, typically, right? This is probably one of the lowest barriers, uh, you know, for entry for a new industry, which a lot of people, this is a second career for them. Um, so I, I definitely get it, but I, I agree with you. I wouldn't mind school being like an extra week and just having that opportunity to, to brainstorm about what other avenues there are, because I think agents would be more fulfilled and more successful in contributing back to the industry. Do you think that also contributes to the type of burnout we experience that we often hear from, I mean, you've, we've all experienced burnout in some part of this process, but do you think that that's a big part of it, that they're trying to, f they really are not allowing themselves to find those other avenues? Yeah, I, I think it's tough because I think that everybody probably knows, you know, in their immediate circle, you know, four or five, six agents or more um, because of the low, low, cost and low um, requirements for, for entry. Like, there's not a lot of barriers to entry. And I think the challenge there specifically is people just don't know better, you know? And so they think it's really easy. Half the time they've been on a deal, maybe they did their own purchase or, or you know, horror stories from a friend or relative of how terrible an agent was. Similarly, you have stories about how great they are, but it's the horrible ones that make people think that they can just jump into the industry and just, do, I can do the job better. You know, I, I'm sure there, there's, Plenty of people that are clients of realtors in a transaction that end up becoming agents themselves because they're like, hey, that wasn't so bad or I didn't think that was that tough and that was a lot of money to pay. I did that myself. Why wouldn't I get my license, right? And then you marry that with the folks that are like staying home or, you know, maybe their first primary career is, is doesn't generate enough income, right? So you see a lot of people crossing over where, you know, for instance, we have somebody I'm thinking about on our team that is a school teacher and they supplement their income you know, on evenings and weekends with being a real estate agent. You know, the great thing about this, and I always tell people that I'm really lucky that the circle of people that are around me while I'm building my career are really good people. So there's mm -hmm. you, there's Sekou, who's also mm -hmm. on your team. Like, There's a lot of amazing people that are, I'm such a millennial, so I'm going to say it. You guys are not gatekeepers. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, and you're really great teachers. So how do you educate, even if it's a new agent or a seasoned agent or, you know, people who are changing careers like you and I have, yeah. so, how do you encourage them to look outside of the box? Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer that people will, will be and mm, nature versus nurture, I guess, is what it comes down to, right? I, I think that for the most part, nature drives people, right? I, I'm i going to hate prospecting because I don't like being on the phone. I could be taught how to prospect, but naturally I'm going to get lazy about it or I'm not going to really want to do that um, just because it's not something I feel comfortable doing, right? So you're going to have an agent that says that. You can teach them again to be a great agent, but I think the natural inclination is going to be, hey, there's maybe you know, 18, 19 different ways that you can earn money as a real estate agent, right? You could do CMAs, you could be, um, you know, commercial agent, you could do prospecting, you could send mailers, et cetera, right? I think people will will kind of defer to um, what they're most comfortable in. So what we encourage is pick three to five things that you can see yourself generating money from as a real estate agent, right? And, it, you know, again, it's everything I just said, like maybe you're a prospector, maybe you're doing mailers, maybe you're doing um, open houses, whatever it is. And then figure out a strategy of what that has to look like for you to be successful financially. So for instance, if I want to be a prospector, I have to have, you know, five two-way conversations every day. And that would net me, you know, three transactions a month. And if I have three transactions with the average sales price of $650,000, I'm going to net X dollars. And then multiply that by the 12 months because I'm going to be consistent at it. Great. That nets two hundred thousand years in sal two hundred thousand a year in salary. Does that help me attain my goal? Right. So we we teach to kind of coach and reverse engineer what your goals are and what that looks like in terms of effort. Um, and, and that has definitely helped. Seiko is an awesome awesome coach, as you mentioned him. Um, but it's really understanding the individual's needs, where they're comfortable. And then, of course, we try to push them, right? Like everybody should have a stretch goal. So, out of those three to five items that you might be looking at in terms of generating income, you know, maybe three or four of those are really comfortable to me. 
but I hate prospecting and everything I said about prospect. I personally don't like prospect, but you know what? I'm going to prospect because I want to grow as an individual. I want to grow my skill set and it keeps me challenged. That's fine. But it's not my core. Like my core are three to four items that I am very comfortable at that I'm going to push naturally to be the best version of myself. So we, we tried to make sure that people challenge themselves, but at the same time that they're operating at the best of their capacity because that's where they're going to show up and work the hardest for themselves and for us. Now, in your opinion, why do you think more traditional brokerages don't? Because let's be honest, EXP is not normal. So I'm not even going <laughs> to say that. Yeah. Oh, it's like everything else. No, it's not. <laughs> EXP is not normal. Okay. Yeah. It's like, you know, P Professor Xavier's school mm -hmm. <laughs> from X-Men <laughs> with a, a metaverse S thing going on. <laughs> and a ton of education and a lot of fun. Sure. But how do you you know for someone who understands that how come traditional brokerages don't encourage that type of conversation or you know growth why 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 do you think they're so stagnant is the best way i can explain it yeah so I, with like you know compass keller williams like i'm just using as examples you know yeah. uh stephen hay uh what was it brown hayes there you go mm -hmm. and you know, the other ones that they're announcing, you know, that the market's changing. And I personally, I've seen it from working here that the, I don't think it's changing in a way that it's declining. I think it's just shifting. So how come we're not seeing the business shift when the market shifts or that or the interest shifts? I, I think you will. I think you will, because now EXP has provided an interesting dilemma. Right. And the dilemma means we don't have to operate the way we used to. And I'm speaking as an agent. Right. I, I have options. I have an alternative that actually shifts that focus, as you said, onto me as an agent. Um, the bro biggest challenge I have with the, the big brokerages is that they were only as good as the local talent in each of those brokerages. Right. So if you had a dynamite ops manager, they were fantastic. You would have you would see the effects of that in that brokerage, but you couldn't compare. I'm going to just arbitrarily pick two Keller Williams offices because of the, the local talent in each one. If one had rock star talent and the other one didn't, you would see that that rock star brokerage would have a lot better culture, training, discussions, you know, everything, and that would make it a far better experience for the agent there. Um, that said, when EXP came out, we joined in 2019, um, and we were the first team in Jersey to do so, uh, or one of the first teams, I should say, but certainly one, I think one of the largest when we joined. The problem there was that nobody had heard of EXP, and what happened was everybody, it's almost like the claws that those other brokerages came out, and it was like, you guys are going to fail, you're not going to be successful. What is EXP? I've never heard of it. No chances are going to survive. And what that forced us to do was we galvanized together with other EXP members across you know, the U.S. at the time. So we had teams that um, were even larger than ours that were very successful. And because of the nature of the relationships and our being in a similar situation where it was almost like our backs against the wall, fighting like against the other brokerages, that it strengthened us. And so I'll give an example. We're a two hundred million dollar team. We do two hundred million annual sales. There are teams out there that do six hundred million, and I say that because they grew to a point they've already overcome the hurdles that I'm facing today. You know, and I hope one time, I you know, one point in the future, we'll get to that point. But they're willing at EXP to open up their playbook and and talk to us about it. So I've had very candid conversations with those teams. You know, I've met with their ops folks. I've seen their training. You know, I they, they talk about technology. We have masterminds, and they're willing to help. And they don't look at it as competition. One because we're, you know, you know, geographically we're not bound. So you're as good as anybody that you talk to. I can have a team in San Diego. I can have a team in Chicago. Um, I can have a team in Jersey, and I'm no threat to them. Um, but at the same time, they want to help. And so EXP that that's that's the difference. It's the talent. It's the Non-competitiveness, I, I feel like a lot of brokerages, one of the challenges are that, you know, the term is commission breath. Everybody doesn't know where the commission is coming from. So they'll, they'll, you know, 
I, I, there are definitely things that they would do that would not make me feel comfortable. Um, whereas I'm incentivized to help other people. Like if I can help you become the best agent that you can be, even if we're competing in the same space, EXP incentivizes me based upon your success. So I'm going to win some, I'm going to lose some, but even for the ones I lose, I still win. Well, the great thing also, you mentioned it was about the fact that there's no, the, the, the drama for competition is not really there. It's a, it's a collective. Yeah. And I think that allowed us as real estate agents to be more entrepreneurial. So yeah. we had the freedom to say, you know what? I really am not that passionate about the rental market. I want to do more in commercial and work with small businesses, which, you know, which is Genesis is all about. So, <laughs> so it allowed us to build a business as opposed to having a real estate hustle. That's right. So That's how right. do you explain people, how do you explain to people who don't understand that distinction? Because we always know, I mean, you're from New Jersey and from New York, we, we both get this, but we know that it's, you know, business and a hustle. Yeah. But sure. how do you get out of the mindset that once you get your license, the first thing you have to do is build the hustle. But in reality, it's more building a business. Like, how do you get them out of that into that transition from the desperation of a hustle to the structure and foundation and long term growth of a business? Yeah. So I, I think there's a couple of things. I, so I always use an analogy where you could have a doctor and he's a very or she's a very successful doctor and they have a practice. Right. At some point, while they're still a doctor, they're also a business owner, right? And, and they just happen to be in the business of medicine. It's similar to that with real estate to me, where when you go back to the levers I talked about, like you can generate income, you know, any of 18, 19 different ways, pick the three to five that you're most interested in or that work resonate with you the most. You get exposure to that. You tend to lean towards that. And if you see the opportunities to use your real estate license, to grow in each of those capacities, no day really seems like work. Like you're coming in, you're like, it's not so bad because it's something I love to do. Now, when you marry that with, hey, I can make income off that, I can have a steady growth in the business. Um, that's where you see people grow. Like I look at Jen Kuhn, Jen Kuhn is an agent in uh, Jackson down in New Jersey. And she has, she's a real estate agent. She does short sales. She's got a team, very successful. Um, but then she started like a title company, an insurance company. She's got a school, right? All these are offshoots of the real estate industry that that resonated with her. And then as she generate, as she figured out that there was ways to to generate income related to a real estate license, they became full fledged businesses. Now, and that's really the important thing. Like to understand like what can you do with your license i mean obviously what i did with mine was went more grassroots with it but mm -hmm. you know people i i use this story a lot of when i first got started i will never forget this there was an opera singer who worked for the met mm -hmm. and she taught she obviously was marketing within her own industry but she also taught other you know, people from the Met, like the staff and the artists, how to build real estate portfolios. Yeah. So she would do that, but she was an opera singer. She would do that. That's her career. I think she's on tour right now. <laughs> but And for me, in my head, I went, that's really cool. I would yeah. like to do that. And says, well, you'd be surprised. There are people who are jazz musicians and they'll mm -hmm. take their license and, you know, teach people how to, you know, they're Airbnb specialists, so they'll tell people how to look for short term rentals or get in that industry or get in that specialty. Yeah. So, I, how did, when do you get to the point when you realize I can pretty much do whatever I want as long as it makes sense? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 think it, I think it comes from like that internal motivation to, to do more, see more, do more, because the opportunities are around you. Um, like the example that I, I just mentioned with, with Jen Kuhn, right? She saw an opportunity and was like, hey, I can generate income off it. It's not a huge stretch given what I've got to do, but you know what I've already got for my skill set. And then she put together the plan and kind of just uh, went at it, right? So similar to that, it's as you navigate the real estate industry, residential, commercial, whatever, there are going to be opportunities and there are going to be things that talk to you. So the example you use with, you know, like short sales, maybe it's a short sale investor or an Airbnb investor. 
right? It's like, hey, listen, there's an opportunity to make money. Great. So maybe I become that expert and I, I talk to my clients about it. Great. How do I commoditize that? And so with that, you know, a lot of like the self-help gurus talk about having, you know, almost like a, that your personal board of directors around you, right? Four or five people, different industries. It, it, it definitely shouldn't be real estate, but that, you know, may, might be like the entrepreneur is one of them. And they're like, I always see the money aspect or how to make money off a scenario. You've got the person that's like a governance compliance person. Like, hey, does this sound unethical to you, et cetera? And, and just, I guess the point is, is to have people that you could bounce ideas off of. Um, and, and then going back to the EXP model, that like we have that. I have people that I can I can reach out to and be like, hey, you know, what does this sound like to you? What did you guys, what were you thinking when you did X and how that took, you know, your your business that whole new level? Because that's something I'm, I'm considering, right? So you have that panel of people around you, that board of directors to, to really help tr- share your vision and drive you. And, and they're not biased because they care about you in whatever capacity. It's not, it doesn't have to be family, it doesn't have to be friends, but it's people that care about your output, your outcome, and, and are willing to help and impart their knowledge. And you just get a different perspective. But to answer your question, you're also in deals and you'll see opportunities. Like see, you know, like, hey, that person did title, the title was $900. What do they actually have to do? And what does that mean? How many title jobs they do and how many people work with this so it might be just having those simple conversations with people related to, to your real estate world and figure, and learning first off but also seeing what that journey's like and seeing if it's you know one of your lead levers that you want to do for income how do you communicate that though because that really is right now i'm working on a project and one of the things that they asked me was can you list all the real estate specialties and niches that are connected to you know your license or connected to that concept and like that is a long list that's not like you know it's not you know you know early education but you have these things there's there's media there's lead generation there's Mm -hmm. you know Com- there's commercial, but there's com- sub things in commercial like contracting and design and architecture. Like there's so many layers to it. So how do you get them to understand that it's not just one thing? It's not just like five specialties and then I give it to you. It's a it's a it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it'll be new ones all the time, right? So if you look at like um, uh, in the COVID world, right? All of a sudden, it became perfectly acceptable to use FaceTime to do open houses or to do walkthroughs or showings of apartments, right? Or also during that time, Matterport really kicked in where you get the virtual floor plans, right? So I, to your point, that technology or the, the new way to make money in real estate, that list will always evolve. But I think that as long as you're current with it and you're keeping up with the industry, and that could be through you know, podcasts, it could be through just you know, um, subscribing to journals or local newspapers. Like I constantly like read like realtor related material wherever I can get my hands on it because it might tell me about the national economy, the local economy, uh, what's to be expected with prices. We also join masterminds with people in our area and outside our area. Um, you know, in our area helps us to understand the, our finger on the pulse of the market locally. But you know, on a national scale, it's like, Oh, okay. Things are are very different. So even like close to home, New York, New York State and New Jersey are very different in terms of the whole real estate process. I have a license in both, and it's not uh, it's not even remotely close the process. That you know? is, that's correct. I mean, yeah, yeah. In New Jersey, I people make fun of it, but even just investing is there's two different. It's two different worlds. I think New Jersey's more, in my opinion, from my perspective, is more suburban esque based in it. Mm-hmm. You know, when people look at homes or look at multifamily units or multi units in general, they see the community aspect of it. Yeah. In New York, it's more, it really is a numbers game here. Right. You know, even if you're buying a, a, a starter home for yourself, that starter home has to do something. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, so I tell people that in New York, even, even if you're buying a condo 
or a co-op, you really are not buying, you're really investing because of the <laughs> amount of time you're putting into this purchase. That's right. That's and right. I find it fascinating that people just assume that all you do is just some buy some property. That's yeah. right. That's right. So how so at least with me, I think it was really important when I got started. The great thing when I got started with EXP, I started, I treated my brain like started from scratch mm -hmm. and I did a business plan. Yeah. And I listened to everything you guys said. Yeah. I just shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I realized that I could merge my love for community and small businesses with my respect and knowledge of real estate into one thing, which is why I'm going commercial next year. And I am excited. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's because I had the information and I had the resources, something I did not get in the very beginning. I have really good brokers. I'm not saying they're not really good people. And they were very, you know, protective as I was mm -hmm. trying to figure this out. But the, the vastness, I was not aware of. Yeah. And how do you... Basically, here's my question without me trying to explain. I know I have a history of like dancing around an issue, so I'm going to yeah. ask the question directly. How do you explain real estate to people? So, you know, I, it, it depends on what the angle is, right? If it's an investor versus a person that's considering becoming an agent, right? If it's an agent, you know, I, I make sure that they understand that there's definitely a disconnect between the textbook version of real estate as well as what's on TV and the real world. Um, it's not as simple, but as long as you have, like you said, like a business plan, you've got a mindset as to how you want to generate income, what you want to do, a good mentor, um, you'll you'll be you'll be fine. You know, um, it also depends on what you want to get out of it, right? Some people are like, hey, this is my my secondary job or my tertiary job. I'm just trying to fill in some gaps. You know, so maybe I'll just do some rentals here and there uh, or spending money, you know, it's kind of like just be true to yourself, understand your purpose and what you're looking to get out of the relationship, whatever it is, uh, and use that as a guiding point to stay true to yourself. And again, also challenge yourself to to maybe surprise yourself. Um, on the flip side of that, if I'm talking to clients, it's again trying to know what their what their end goal is, right? So if it's an investor, like you had said, um, you know, is it is it a certain cap rate that they're looking for? Is it purely numbers, right? Because from a commercial or an investor perspective, it doesn't matter if it's the next great area. It doesn't matter, you know, like there's certain data points that are more important than anything else. And the house is almost immaterial. Like the house is just represents numbers and their means to an end. So, okay, so let's do like a scenario. Let's say you have career day. I avoid <laughs> those like the plague when I was in high school, did not know <laughs> that will come bite me later. <laughs> But let's say you were invited to a career day mm -hmm. and you had to explain what you do. Sure. What would you say? So I, I would say that I my goal is to understand my clients and educate them well enough that they can make a decision that works better for the long term goals. And by the way, it's it's through the purchase or transacting real estate. Um, you know, so helping them understand what the, the journey looks like, shepherding them through the process itself, answering questions, being, you know, I, like I feel like at, at times in, in my career with different clients, you know, I, I was an educator. I was a guardian. Like, hey, have you thought about this? Is this an issue to you? You know, I, I you know, or is, is that a water stain, right? There's certain boundaries that you could play in um, ethically and still, you know, make sure that your client's protected as best as possible. Um, you know, I've also been like a marriage counselor. And I, I, I say that tongue in cheek, but it's like, you know, there are clients where there are a couple and one really likes the house and one doesn't like a house. And you have to be that neutral third party, again, like a counselor, where you're like, hey, listen, you know, emotionally, we might like it. Maybe there's a different way to look at it that we haven't considered. So let's do like a pros and cons list and we'll, we'll do it together. Right. And it, it, it's like, you try to help them make the best decision for them as best as possible. 
Um, you know, other, other times, like as I said, like as an educator, it's, hey, here are the numbers. You know, have you thought about this is a, an opportunity zone? There are tax benefits to it. Have you talked to your accountant about that? Maybe that's something we could hop on a call with him or her about and, and talk through it. You know, but maybe on the surface, it doesn't look like a great investment, but I think it could be, and here's why. That's a that's a good way of looking at it. And the interesting thing is you mentioned multiple times, you kind of bring like your personality into the business. Yeah. You know, when we get started, and I'm sure you've had experiences with this where I call them pretty people, but we <laughs> see you know, we see people that they kind of look like they're official. Yeah. And you realize later that they're just figured out just like the rest of us, but they kind of, you know, they sound like a real estate agent. They look like a real estate agent and they say all the real estate agent things. Yep. But you find out later that one, they're figuring out just like the rest of us. And two, it was a, a persona that they created. Right. Now, you know, as well as I do, that I don't like faking it till you make it. It is a big pet peeve of mine. I've said that to you multiple times. And I've always wondered why is bringing yourself to the table or bringing your personality or your interest into building a business such a struggle, especially with an industry like ours that is a people-based industry. No matter how you phrase it, it could be insurance, real estate, real estate insurance. It could be as an inspector. It could be an appraiser. It it is a people based business. Why don't we bring our bring our personalities into it? Why do we try to? I don't know. I'm a wrestling fan, so why don't we? Why do we create? You know, our alter egos when we do it. I just I never understood that. Yeah, I think it actually stems from either insecurity, right? Like people aren't comfortable or confident in who they are. Um, but I, I, I 100% agree that you have to be true because people will suss that out, right? Like they'll they'll figure that out pretty quickly if if you're lying to them. Um, and it's just it's just not worth it. And I, I'll say this: it, as I've gotten older and I've earned these grays, I um, I I feel comfortable in my skin. I want to be comfortable in my skin. And I use that as my guiding principle as to act and behave in a way that allows me to sleep better at night. Um, you know, there, there are going to be times where I'm going to highlight things to a client and I might talk them out of a house. And and I'm OK with that because I don't want them ever to, to look back to the experience of working with me and be like, he tricked me into this house. And I don't believe I didn't see that or it's miserable. Right. I want to be your realtor. I want to be your friend's realtor. I want to be your family member's realtor. And I want to work on several transactions with them. So for me, the journey is the long game. Um, and plus, I, again, I like to sleep at night. And, and I think that sometimes people in our industry get affected by what we call commission breath, where they're like, hey, I just want the commission. And and I understand that because as 1099 employees, you don't necessarily have that, that steady income or you don't know where that next, you know, bout of money is coming from but at the same time I, I you know there's a price to, to to pay and it's like it's it's wherever you, your ethics and your comfort and integrity let you sleep at night as you got as i got older, that that came true to me <laughs> so how do you and i know i'm i'm asking you these questions because there's certain things that i feel like we are not addressing certain elephants in the room we're not addressing when we, during the process of the education, getting your license, picking the brokerage and life after that. Yeah. And the thing is, those things need to be discussed. You know, we should know that not everyone's interested in being a rental agent. They may want to use their photography skills and be a, a listing agent. I mean, that may be their thing. Sure. How do we encourage them to be themselves when they're going through this process. I feel like over time you tend to lose sight of that after a while. So how do you, how do you, from someone who does understand that, how do we protect that? But I think you have to want it. You have to want it from within. It's like anything else, right? Like I want to be in good shape. And for that to happen, I have to eat right. I have to go to the gym. 
there's a certain discipline that you have to have when it comes to your moral and, and ethic, you know, compass, right? So for instance, there are plenty of times, like I can name examples where I've been on deals and, you know, buyers have been like, hey, listen, if you get me this house, I'll, I'll give you a cash bonus or, I, you know, I'll, I'll get you that Rolex. And I'm like, I would love those things, quite frankly. But my ethics, besides my license ethics, it, it doesn't feel right. It, it, you know, and if it doesn't pass the smell test, it doesn't let me sleep easy at night. You know, and it's you're constantly going to run into those challenges. But you have to you have to kind of like weigh, you know, the the pros and cons of it. And if you truly want to make that change, it, it won't be an option. Like that Rolex from from a client that just wants the house because I'm the listing agent. It's not an option. It's off the table. Right. And it has to be off the table, because if I start thinking about it, then my ethics get compromised. And I'm like, I, I can't sleep easy at night because of that, because what happens, you know, say I take it. Obviously, I'm in full violation of my ethics for my license. But now this person is going to be like, hey, you took it on the last one. Here's here's a matching ring or. Or like, and then what am I going to say? Like, no, I, I don't do that. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't lend well. You really have to want to make that change from from within. Do you think that part of the problem as to why we see that so often? You know, agents time. Not. I'm not going to say peter out, but transition into more of a shell of themselves is because mm -hmm. they don't protect the thing that makes them cool <laughs> i yeah I, I think it's hard right because there's a lot going on you have financial pressures of you know hey coming out of school or going into school you thought this was going to be the most glorious you know new career ever and it's easy and everybody's doing it and everybody knows somebody that's wildly successful and sells a ton of homes and why can't i do that so you get caught up with everything that the industry can afford you. And I would question, do you actually really love what the work is? Because in the real world, they don't see you calling a list of 500 people. They don't see you getting hung up on or cursed at or, or, you know, worse, like door knocking or, or getting yelled at for sending them a flyer, right? I, I can go down every one of those 18, 19 ideas that we have to generate income. And there's, there's a response from a client or a potential client that sucks. And it's like if you don't necessarily subscribe to um, that action and that action making you money as a, to become a successful real estate agent, I, I would argue that you probably will not love the industry. And it's going to be very different than what you set out for or how easy you thought it was going to be, that you're going to become disenchanted and you're going to become that shell that you talked about. You know what? I think we should ask that question. Why do they romanticize real estate? Nothing against selling sunset and million dollar <laughs> things in yeah. LA and all those people. But they tend to make real estate very pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it that people tend to romanticize an industry that's very rough in, in the sense that there's a lot of, and you said it, it's incredibly emotional there's moments where you'll have like ebbs and flows like everything will have its own you know everything is a puzzle in its own way yeah. but why do why is it such a romantic industry like why do people think that i get my real estate license and i'm going to look like ryan sirhan yeah. you won't most of the time, you look like Freddie Joe. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's true, but you know, it, like I think you know, social media, TV, like they sell like that sexiness. They sell the story that they want you to hear. In some senses, right? It's not just the real estate industry. It could be house flipping. Again, related to it, but there are plenty of times that I've walked onto job sites and you see folks that you know probably that they don't know their way around a construction site and I'm, I'm not saying that they should right because there's a, a learning experience and all that but you know they're walking around they're like oh i want this here i want that there and they've got like their contractor in tow and i'm like i don't know that you're going to sell it because i don't think you've considered you're using that tv story experience of how it's so easy and i can make money in any market as like a builder 
But I'm like those builders that are out there that are actually grinding will will know what sells in a neighborhood, what doesn't sell, right? Because you can't overbuild in a neighborhood. And I feel that people that don't realize that get exposed financially, you know, they'll, they'll overbuild a house, they won't be able to sell it. And then next thing you know, you know, they're losing money. And then they're, they're just chasing the dollar. They're not staying true to who they are. How do you address, how, how do you, and I'm saying like, this is really a big sore subject of mine because nothing against, you know, reality TV and social media. I think anyone who started out trying to figure out if they want to pursue this career mm-hmm. would, would look to social media at some capacity or look at, you know, certain reality shows. But how do you bring them back to earth? Yeah, it's but tough. Still keeping that sense of wonder. <laughs> well, the problem is that everybody learns differently, right? Some people need that loss, and it inspires them to to never make that mistake again and to be more cautious. Other folks will, you know, unfortunately do it and run out of money. But some people, they seem to have like this never ending supply of money too, right? And so the common example in the verbs I look at is. You know, you have two people in a in a partnership. Maybe one has a corporate job or their own business, and they have, you know, a ton of money. And then you have the other person, and it's just something to like bide their time. And they're not necessarily like very pragmatic about it. They're they're like, yeah, it is what it is. It's it's like a time pass, if you will. And it's like you just have to be really careful. What, what my suggestion is is to just be really passionate about what you are, be the best version you could be, and you'll get rewarded for it some way, shape, or form, right? Like constantly, like, yearn to, to learn. But what – and I, I do agree, mm-hmm. but I still don't understand, and maybe it's just me, that they think – and I'm not saying everyone thinks that way. I'm not that all-man, all-woman thing. That's crazy. But mm-hmm. – <laughs> I just wonder what what's our responsibility as people who are in the industry to balance out the the glamour that they see. I, you know, I, I think that there's ways to kind of introduce what a day in the life is for a realtor, right? Um, kind of like, hey, I, I get that you think it's like a sexy, glamorous job, and we're just drinking mimosas and going to open houses and, you know, shopping, you know, and, and putting together like gift baskets for our clients. And it's not like that at all. Um, but I think that if people were to share what the journey is, like show us how you're on the phones eight hours a day, just dialing. Right. And show us how you're doing follow and how you get hung up on or cursed at or, you know, violated, you know, like, hey, you violated my FCC rights. I'm on a no, no call list though you check the list before you dial and and kind of just seeing that there there's a there's definitely a lifestyle you know they say 10% of the agents do 90% of the business right and i think there's another stat that says like there's this some high number or percentage of agents that fail in their first year and i think it's that disconnect that you're talking about where they don't really understand what it is that you really have to do to get business the one thing i always say about real estate is your whatever you put into it is what you get out of it. Um, you know, if you're willing to put in the eight hour days and 10 hour days, you'll get those results and you might have to wait a while, but you'll, you'll get it. That discipline, that muscle will, will be rewarded. But if you're a person that's lackadaisical about it, um, you know, you're like, Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll do one of those lead levers when I feel it's convenient, but I'm going, you know, whatever to the gym or I'm hanging out with my kids or, or whatever I'm going on vacation. Um, you're going to find that you have less control of the success that you have. Um, but I think that people, agents specifically, kind of showcasing the pros and cons. Let's just highlight what it, what it looks like. You know, I, I, there's so many times that you see new listings, and it'll be like a luxury listing, and there's Lamborghinis in, in the driveway, and the agent's pulling up in it, and they're like, hey, welcome to my new listing. And I'm like, if you look at them in the MLS, they've sold like three houses all year. You know, it, it doesn't pay for the Lamborghini. You know, like stop selling the dream and be realistic about it. It takes hot, hard work and sweat. It's not to say that you can't get there, but you're probably not starting out like that. And that really is the important thing to know. And I think that's why I 
I will say this, brokerages have so much responsibility in addressing that. Yeah. That how not just how to understand your license and the laws of your state, which everyone should abide by. I'm not saying you <laughs> shouldn't, but yeah. how to build a business. I think part of when you're a new agent, you kind of biggest mistake ever made was never taking the advice of interviewing your brokerages. Should have done that. Did not do that. I joined Keller Williams because I was an intern for one of the brokers. So I can mm. while I was studying for my license. And then I said, you know what? Then I have bad and the coffee's good. Let's go to Keller Williams. So, <laughs> yeah. And it, I got lucky that it turned out well and it yeah. led me to other things. Mm -hmm. But I really should have taken that time and understand that when you're a newer agent, you're really focusing on a good kind of like a business school. You know, how to build, you know, your 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 sphere of influence. I know that I will say that sentence again. <laughs> uh your you know building of different revenue streams how to market without depending on just your broker you know things like that i didn't really learn that unless i learned it on my own yeah. or i got really like i said i had two i had two amazing managing brokers where they were really nice to me to teach me those things and they took me under their wing but largely enough I didn't understand what it meant until I stepped out of the assumption bubble. And yeah. then when I joined EXP, which is cloud-based, which allowed us to have that resource and those and that network and that that knowledge outside of just not just EXP University, but the others, you know, mm -hmm. individual agents teaching you things, you got the mentorship programs and everything, is when I realized that this could this this is what I was looking for that that balance between growth, knowledge, education, support, think tank. So, <laughs> <laughs> why is it that brokerages are not so? They're not. Let's just explain why is it they're not very business college or knowledge based, but they're so you know, basic? Yeah. So it's a great question. And and I, I, I always look at it in the example I gave about the doctor earlier on, right? You have a, a doctor establishes a practice. At some point, he becomes a, a, a business owner of a practice that just happens to be medicine, right? Same thing happens here where you have these like agents that probably were superstars, had enough money to purchase into the brokerage. And as a result, they're running a brokerage. It doesn't make them a good business owner because they were a good agent. And we we in America do a lot of that, um, even from a corporate America perspective or any 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 company perspective. We tend to promote the people that are good individual workers. Right. Like I, I'm looking out my window, I'm looking at my grass. But, you know, it's a landscaping company. The gentleman that cuts the grass, maybe he becomes like the best or he he's he becomes the foreman. Right. Because he's the star, shining star of that team. And then at some point, you know, his, his trajectory increases in the company. I would argue that just because he's really great at cutting grass and, you know, making sure that the, the, the truck is loaded in the morning doesn't make him a manager. It's a different skill set. And as a business owner, you have to have a different skill set. Um, and, and that knowledge is business, how to coach people, how to train people how to understand gaps in the business, how to look at financial statements, how to do forecasts. Um, there's so much into it, marketing, right? It, like every aspect, there's so many, they're very specific um, pillars of every business, right? You're gonna have accounting, you're gonna have technology, you're gonna have finances, you're gonna have systems, operations, marketing, right? You have to be good at all those, and then you have to be a subject matter expert in your industry. It's not enough to just be a rock star in one and expect success. And I think that's the disconnect with brokerages. They're superstar agents probably, or they they can write a check and they can buy into a franchise. And it, it, some some are great. I, I can think of a couple of local brokerages, big name, that are run wonderfully. And it's because of the talent that they have in-house. I think the other thing is a business owner, counter to what I just said, if you don't have the skill yourself as a, as a business owner, it's okay to hire it. It's okay to hire it and find somebody that, that does that can do it on your behalf. It just needs to get done. 
And I think that's the gap is that it's not getting done in a lot of these brokerages. So how, but then here's the flip side to that. Then we look at the teams that are connected to it because most agents will, most newer agents will try to be part of a team to build up and that's their way of building up quickly in a traditional brokerage. And once again, this is just an example. Well, with EXP and there are other, other cloud-based brokerages, I'm not saying there's not, but right now we're both EXP agents. So that's what we're going to go with. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have the same desperation connection. Like we don't have to be part of a team because the whole country is a team. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's and I think that that's the distinction as well that you said it in the beginning that there's the masterminds, there's the classes. If I want to reach out to an agent and ask for advice, I can. You know, there's the staff itself who I have never had more respect for EXP staff than I do right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's so many things that are attached to this that when you're a solo agent, you have a team because the agent's your team. That's right. You just have, like, what I'm trying to do, which you and I have discussed, is I'm trying to build a core team just because I know eventually I'm going to have to delegate, and that is my weakness. So eventually I'm going to have to do that. But and that's really where the team part comes in is the what is the team for yeah. and even if i don't have the core team because i have this network of amazing agents and brokers and mentors and role models i don't if i don't have it yet that's okay because at the very least i can say hey you guys want a referral right. do you guys want to help me with this project and we can co broke yeah. do you want to work with me on this thing so I have that freedom, which allows me to learn, which That's allows right. me to grow my business. Mm -hmm. So I, how do, what can we do? Or what can we do as, <clears throat> you know, because a lot of people mention this, that we'll bring an agent on and after a while they kind of, and I've had this experience twice already, as yeah. you know, when I first started outreach. <laughs> where they'll start and they'll get really excited and then they'll like ghost. Yeah. yeah. Part of the problem when I noticed was that they kind of once again had that romanticized view of what we do. And they talk about the fact that they don't have that structure. We do have a structure. It's yeah. just not, it's in my opinion, not tangible. It's the struggle structure we create for ourselves as business, as business owners. That's right. So how do you explain that? How do you explain that you really can be, without sounding like the Army Reserve slogan, anything you want to be in real estate? <laughs> yeah, and I definitely think it's, it, you know, there are a couple of things that we talked about throughout the podcast that I think are applicable here, right? So we talked about, you know, having that panel or board of directors that you can go to. In my mind, that board of directors at a minimum, besides on a personal level, from a professional level, are my exp agents from other places in the country that are doing the biz the amount and volume of business that i want to perform right so exp lends itself to that um aside from that the other challenges that i had with brick brokerages is you know a lot of the moms or the single parents whoever like was providing child care service they would oftentimes have to run home and you know pick up that child or start like that nighttime routine etc that they couldn't even attend the training that they had at the brokerage, right? So you never really got to sharpen your skills as an agent. You never got better. You never learned anything new because you're always time bound. The one thing I liked about EXP for us as well, and, and I was going through it um, as being the primary caregiver for my kids, is I was able to launch learning anytime I wanted to in the EXP world, right? So if based upon my schedule, I can only do it at 11 o'clock after the kids went to sleep, after you know my wife and I had dinner together and quality time, that I can launch training and I can become a better agent by tomorrow. Whereas with the other brokerages, it was like, hey, you're gonna have to wait till next month. And guess what? By the way, it's also gonna be at two o'clock next month too. You know? And, and so I say this to say that I think at the end of the day, you have to figure out what's important to you. You mentioned structure, right? And this training, the virtual training, as well as the opportunity to to network and, and mastermind with with folks around the globe uh also learning from what 
like putting a finger on the pulse of the local industry, the national, however, you're going to read articles, you're going to level up. Like all these things are paramount. Like I think you have to have that built into your day and add to it prospecting, you know, everything else that we do as agents uh, to round out your skill set and, and become the best version of you as possible. Now, to once again, we are discussing topics that normally we either hear a lot or are not discussed enough. Mm -hmm. Here's my another elephant in the room question. How do we encourage them to explore? I, I, I think I think that part is really important to know because yeah. you said it yourself about, you know, the, the lady in uh, New Jersey who you know, not just has a real estate license, but she is a mortgage broker. She has the titles, just lean. She has other things going for her within that, within that industry and within that specialty. You know, you mentioned, you know, the, the agent who has the, you know, interest in development and all the other stuff. How do we encourage them to explore past the norm? Yep. So I, I think it, it goes back to what we talked about, about staying true to yourself. And I think that you have to get exposure to all these different areas, either by reading up on it, seeing what other people masterminding with them are doing, et cetera, um, or even just reading up on it and and figuring out, staying true to yourself, whether or not it's something you have an appetite to do. And then understanding what the, you know, like the barriers for entry are. You know, is it I have to go back to school? Maybe that's a non-starter for some people. Or, you know, it, it takes 180 hours. Like it's like a journeyman path and it's not for me, you know, or, or it is for me. And, and just staying true as to what it is. There's so many opportunities also to have those conversations with people that are already doing that role. So if, if it's a title company, you can talk to a title company. If it's insurance, you can talk to them. You know, if it's an attorney, you could talk to them. It's definitely making sure that you are always networking because, you know, you talked about sphere of influence before. You never know where your next deal is going to come from to some extent, right? Um, but being open to the fact that that deal can come from anywhere and everybody you meet is either a potential client or an ally on a, on a, on a project. And just really seeing what is interesting enough to, to further develop. And you may work at something and find out, hey, I don't ever want to research title again, right? But at least you can say conclusively that I can cross it off my list of things that I was considering. What advice would you give for new for new agents or agents that have hit a wall yeah. and they are trying to figure out how to, what's next? What, yeah. what advice would you give them? So I, it's the same advice for both. Um, or at least there's a lot of overlap, right? For new agents, it would be to find a mentor. It doesn't necessarily mean join a team. It could be a team, um, but find somebody that will will guide you. Um, you know, one of the things you mentioned at EXP, for instance, you have somebody that will sponsor you. Not every sponsor is the same. You know, find somebody that you click with well, somebody that wants to pour time and effort into to you. Um, and, and maybe that person ultimately becomes part of your board of directors that I've mentioned earlier, right? Um, and, and then just learn and learn as much as you can as you go and never forget to kind of challenge yourself, right? Don't just get stagnant. Always always be pushing to be better. And I keep drawing the examples of the, of the gym into things, right? But if you can do a certain amount of weight, you know, challenge yourself to get past that. Maybe it's a certain amount of reps, but you want to be able to just every day be better than you were yesterday. Um, and the same thing applies to to being a realtor, really anything you do. Just try to sharpen your skill set in that arena. And if that means that you're reaching out to people and learning from them or you're reading about it um, or you're joining a team, any combination, it's, it's to do that. The guidance to the team, again, it overlaps a lot. The other thing I would say with that or the nuance there is similar to a brokerage for an individual agent. Make sure you interview them make it like a job interview for for them like why should they hire you some brokerages are like a body shop right they don't know whether or not you'll be successful so they'll bring you on or it's not a lot of added um financial or burden for them to bring it on 
because they have the systems and processes to accept a new person. Great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to work well for you. So ask those hard questions. You know, what does training look like? What does, you know, the day in the life of an agent, what are you encouraging me to do? What is, what is um, you know, your mentor program look like? How do I make sure that I'm going to be successful at this thing? Because I'm going to bring the work ethic, you know, with me and, and the integrity and everything else. And, and the, But how do I get deals? What would you do for me? And, and vice versa, what can I do for you? Maybe it's, hey, I'm going to host every open house that I can every weekend. And I'm going to do that for two years. I'm going to build my database of buyers, right? And I'm also, by extension, going to get sellers from that and referrals. Great. But that's the sacrifice I'm going to do for the two years because years three and on are going to be much easier as a result of that action. Yes, it was. <laughs> Those losses really did come in handy. Yeah. yeah. I don't lie. Probably because I I understand I got to meet people and it's not meet people in the sense of like let's get to know your city. I already know about New York. Yeah. I mean in the sense you get to know the complexities behind making certain decisions, especially in a rental when you're renting, because yeah. you know renting in the city is expensive. You know that I know that that's not a that's not new, yeah. but understanding how nuanced it is and i think that's the part that we don't discuss enough and i and obviously you are coming back because you were in the first one you'll be back again <laughs> but that's the one thing we don't discuss enough and which is the really important part with this podcast was this episode was the fact of those nuances of if you're gonna get a license in real estate or cosmetology i have someone who has a real estate license and a, her cosmetology license more power to her okay and that's because there's nuance to building something that one is people oriented mm -hmm. two can have the growth you're looking for. If you apply it the right way, you're mm -hmm. not bound by what the norms are, because as you said yourself, things change all the time. The market changes all the time. And what, what made sense, let's put it this way. I'm 34 years old. There's no MLS book anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. There's no um where they used to do this. They took the last uh phone booth from me from Central mm -hmm. Park. Okay, I mean from Times Square, like not mm -hmm. too long ago. Yeah. You know, there's no a lot of those things don't exist because it's evolving. Yeah. And the education part of business of our industry has to evolve as well. Because that's the way they're gonna learn. Hey, I may not be great and this thing or may not be my interest but i love and this is an amazing woman named katina out in tennessee she's an agent with the xp well she loves she started out in container homes and that's yeah. her thing and she's the expert of it i talk to her religiously about container homes because she knows how that process works that's right it really is down to what you want to do and that was really important to have you on here for people to understand that it's not linear that's right. And I, once again, I know I'm sending a lot to the entire podcast, but I really am very, very lucky that the people that I've met with EXP and the people that nurture my career understand, one, my brain, and two, that knows that the world is changing and what my role in that is. And I wanted to thank you for that because you're actually the first person I met with EXP <laughs> and you were really understanding that, hey, she doesn't view her license as just a regular seller agent. She really wants to do something with it. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> it was perfect. It was so clear. Too. Right. And saying now to you, that I'm going commercial next year is a big part for me. I did tell Seiko probably because I wanted to make sure that your stuff didn't get impacted in the process. No, <laughs> no, Jason's good. I'm like, okay, I can tell him now. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. But, but, that, okay. but that was really a concern for me because I have a tendency to be very loyal, especially mm -hmm. to good people who really taught me a lot about how to build a business that fits my integrity and my morals. Mm -hmm. And I also fact with the fact that you like my, most of my posts, but, <laughs> <laughs> and, but, <I> do. <laughs> but it's really, 
inspiring. And I wanted to thank you for that. No, I appreciate it. I, you know, it's funny because, you know, you mentioned your age and, and, you know, you're so young in your career or for years, but you're so wise beyond it. I mean, even when we first met, you had such a vision, you know, for where you wanted to go. And I feel, you know, that people much older, myself included, don't necessarily have that straight path and you're that they don't have that vision right? and they're kind of just like searching around the dark but you were like this is what i want to do and you were so clear with it that it was like you made it easy so for what it's worth thank you and yeah. um just like we did in the first one we're gonna do that again we're bringing that back how was your year so far it's been pretty amazing i, I i've hit a lot of personal records for milestones um, highest dollar value sold, toughest transactions, team stuff that that we're we're working on. Um, you know, we launched in a new city in Chicago as well for a team. Um, you know, a lot of key hires on the team that are just going to help us grow next year. I'll, it's it's been fantastic. It really has. It's been a record year for me sales wise as well. Um, so that balance between my day job of running a real estate team plus also being an agent plus being a dad and a husband and all the rest of that stuff. Um, I, I can't complain. I'm back in the gym. I, I, that's where all my analogies are coming from. It's top of mind to me, you know, and it's not even New Year's. Usually I have that momentum in January, right? And I lose it by like March, like like most people. Um, so I, I'm also excited that it's not even, you know, November yet and I'm, I'm going to the gym. So we'll okay. see. Question number two, what have you learned this year? You know, I, I learned to, to be even more comfortable in my skin. Um, you know, there, there's going to be things that don't sound right, don't pass the smell test. Um, as I get older, that's that's super important to me. And I use that for business as well. I use that for my clients when I'm meeting with them. I, I, don't, I don't think I have commission breath because I don't really care if they buy the house that I'm with them at, right? Because I want the best house for them. And like I talked about the long game, and and you know helping somebody else i've gotten so many referrals this year um from existing clients that it feels really good you know um but that that would be that would be it it becomes your skin whatever that means and i think that covers a lot of what we talked about today whether or not it's the business idea that you want to pursue what real estate looks like to you um you know as well as your personal and professional life okay and name one thing because like I said, we're going to do like we did the first episode. We're doing this again. Sure. Name one thing that you are proud of this year. Hmm. Personal and professional? Don't care. Okay. All right. I uh, I took down the, the, the largest listing for myself, for sure, by leaps and bounds. Um, and then I'm selling their existing home, which is going to be a double one. And what I loved about that transaction is, is, you know, we have like these little reviews. She wrote, you know, the, the client wrote some really, really nice things about me in there. Um, but a testament to that was it was almost like a no, no brainer for them when they're like, yeah, you're the person to sell our, our current home that they've been in for 40 years. And they're like, we love it. And that that meant a lot to me because besides the fact that obviously there's commission and all the rest of that, I it's not so important as the journey because they're like introducing me to their grandkids and their, their kids, their kids live overseas and I got to meet them. And it, it was like being with family more than like a client, uh, the relationships and stuff like that. It's, you know, you can meet a lot of people and, and to have those deeper relationships and know that you had an impact on them and to just see the gratitude is, is pretty awesome. And it doesn't come with commission breath. It comes with kind of doing the right thing and, and being able to sleep at night. That would be nice. I've been taking naps all week. <laughs> well, because you know I'm trying to condense everything. So yeah. that way I'm not like jumping around because you know there's the blog and then there's like the store sure. that got updated. So like so I'm trying to put everything together before I have to spend like six months worth of like classes and mentorship yeah. training. <laughs> so I want to get everything done now while you kind of no one sees me and yeah. then <laughs> there you go. But it's a passion project, right? Like it drives you. Like you're gonna get strength from it. And you you already do so much that like I have no doubt that you're gonna conquer this and do it really well. So thank you so much. How can everyone find you? So I'm 
I'm at the Sikora Group, S-I-K-O-R-A, um, in New Jersey. I also, you know, do work in, in Westchester. Um, so you'll find me on websites there. Um, but that's the easiest way, Jason, J-A-I-S-O-N. All right. Thank you so much for coming back. And you will be back. You know that. Of course.